It was past time for America's pastime to right a wrong. How this ceremonial draft helped Major League Baseball acknowledge some of sports' greatest players, their contributions to the game, and the opportunity they were denied. Then... There will be one point in your life when you're going to look back and everything will make sense. And it is that moment that you're going to realize that you had to go through certain things to become who you are, and you wouldn't go back and change them. You wouldn't, right? The only thing you might want to change after hearing this doctor's story is your own attitude, because she proves the power of passion and persistence. And what one of the world's top experts in personal transformation says about living longer, living healthier, right now on Growing Bolder. What's most important to you? What really matters? Remember when you thought the future was filled with limitless possibility? It still is. Dreams don't have an expiration date. It's not too late to find your purpose, to live with passion, to make an impact in the lives of others and in the world we live in. Stop growing older and start growing bolder. Support for Growing Bolder provided by Hi, I'm Mark Middleton and this is Growing Bolder. They had the skills to play in the big leagues, but they were denied that chance because of the color of their skin. In a symbolic gesture of goodwill, Major League Baseball drafted 30 former Negro League players, the last living links to Jackie Robinson and Satchel Paige, and celebrated those that it once excluded. A gesture that many believed was too little and too late, but there's no question it did mean a great deal to those who heard their names called. Oh, this is one of the greatest days of my life because of, I'm being recognized for something that I, I probably not, didn't ever think I would have the opportunity to do. And it's just, maybe it's a ceremonial thing to a lot of folk, but it means a whole lot to me because of my family. I want my family to know what I've what I done and what I stood for in my life. Today means one of the greatest days of my life to be recognized and the only woman to be drafted to the major leagues. And it's a great thing. And I'm very pleased and very, very happy about that. Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier back in 1947, but it took more than a decade after that for many teams to finally integrate. So many of his contemporaries, players like Skinny Legs Blair and Mamie Peanut Johnson were denied the opportunity until the late 1950s. These are players who paved the way for the diversity that Major League Baseball celebrates today. It's a day decades in the making. Major League Baseball taking another major step to fix a historical wrong. These are all Negro League players who were denied access to Major League Baseball because of the color of their skin. They're the last living links to Jackie Robinson, Satchel Paige, and Josh Gibson. In a largely ceremonial draft, every major league team will select one player, giving each a little money and a lot of love. It was tough on a lot of them, you know, knowing that they couldn't go any further, and then all of a sudden when it did open, they were too old to get, get there. So, I mean, it, it's a shame, but at the same time, I'm, I'm just, you know, it, it's an important thing that we do recognize. It. Hall of Famer Dave Winfield came up with the idea as another bridge to baseball's troubled past. It's one of the more exciting days in their life, something they never thought that they'd see come. I mean, it's ceremonial draft, but to be honored, recognized by Major League Baseball in this fashion, first class, different kind of bus rides than they used to take as we came from the hotel over here. Turned away from hotels, restaurants, and restrooms, life on the road wasn't easy. Sometimes we had to sleep in the bus, Sometimes we had to sleep in our cars or stay at someone's home and everything. There were very few hotels that we could stay in. We used to stop in the city and they'd put two players in with this family and two players with that family. And if you had a good night's sleep, it's okay. If you didn't have a good night's sleep, we had one window on the bus that you could go boo that window and get in the bus and sleep. <laughs> the good news is you made a lot of money playing baseball, didn't you? Made a lot of money. <laughs> well, I signed for 250 a month. 
Houston Astros select a pitcher from the Detroit Stars and the Cincinnati Clowns, Bill Skinny Legs Blair. Bill Blair was the youngest black sergeant to serve in World War II. He was allowed to fight for his country, but not allowed to play in the majors. So after the war, he pitched in the Negro Leagues, throwing a no-hitter and tutoring Hall of Famer Ernie Banks. Blair once took his entire family, all seven kids, to the Negro Leagues Museum in Kansas City to prove his stories are true. They hear me tell a story every once in a while, but they thought I would be just joking. Stories about guys playing barefoot, being a catcher with no glove. And just to hear the stories over and over again, it's, it's awesome. And to know that those stories are real, they weren't made up. So dad was telling the truth after all. Then they said, well, maybe my daddy did do this. And now they know for sure. That's exactly right. Everybody knows for That's sure. That's exactly right. It's taken this amount of time to get recognition, but it's here. And it's not about money, it's about recognition of what you did, what you brought to the game, respect for the game. And I am very, very pleased with Major League Baseball for, for doing this. Blair appreciates the recognition, but what he values most is the opportunity to reconnect with close friends he thought were lost forever. His mother passed, he didn't shed a tear at her funeral. He loved her, but he had to be strong for us. When they walked into the lobby of the Animal Kingdom Lodge, and for my dad to see those guys, that the last time he collectively had an opportunity to see them was parting ways, not at the bus station, not at the airport, but at the train station. But to see these guys and ask about somebody and not know where they were and then to see them now, my dad broke out in tears. That got me, it touched me and it touched my whole family that my dad would be that emotional. Dreams are colorblind and as a young boy, Charlie Pride dreamed big, as in big leagues. When they said who hit the most home runs, not Babe Ruth and Hank Aaron, Charlie Pride. So who was the last 400 hitter, not Ted Williams, Charlie Pride. That was my dream to do, but it didn't happen. I'm not, but I'm not bitter, I'm not regretful. So Pride played in the Negro Leagues in a 1956 exhibition game against a team of major league stars that included Hank Aaron, Willie Mays, and Ernie Banks, Pride struck out 12. He then left the game and applied his determination to building a career in country music. I'm convinced that I'll never be able to go to the, to, to the Hall of Fame in, in Cooperstown, but I'm in the Hall of Fame in country music, and that's good. But I would, it would have been nice to be in both of them. You see what I'm saying? I got yeah. you. Major League Baseball also excluded Latino players who were welcomed by the Negro Leagues. Emilio Navarro is a member of the Puerto Rican Hall of Fame and the oldest living former professional baseball player in the world. I am the man here, the oldest man, 102 years old. 102 years old? Huh? You're not that old. No, I am 102 years old. And I am the oldest man over here. By all accounts, Navarro was one of the best infielders of his era. Everybody said that I was the first, the best second base in that time, but they paid me only $100 uh, uh, a month. A month. Men weren't the only ones discriminated against. Pitcher Mamie Peanut Johnson wasn't allowed to play in the professional women's league. Well, at that time, I was the wrong color. And then again, I, I want to say this, I'm very glad that I wasn't picked because if I had been picked by the girls, I wouldn't be who I am today. And, and, and this makes me very, very proud to be who I am today. Mamie was given a shot by the Negro Leagues, becoming the first woman to play in a men's professional game. The great Satchel Paige taught her how to throw a curve. Johnson won 33 games between 1953 and 1955, and today achieves another historical first. Today means one of the greatest days of my life to be recognized and the only woman to be drafted to the major leagues. How did it feel? What was it like for you to strike out some of the best players in baseball? Beautiful, beautiful. That's how I got the name Peanut. Um, I struck out a gentleman and he said I wasn't big as a peanut. How did I expect to? So I struck him out. So that's how I, I got the name. How did you strike him out? What was your strength? Well, honey, back then I could throw anything anybody else could throw, really. So, and then I had a great catcher. Did you have the heat? Oh yeah, oh yeah. I, I threw 80, 85. Wow. Yeah, 
That was pretty good back then for a girl anyway. They all have a story. In fact, they all have lots of stories, and this gesture of goodwill on the part of Major League Baseball will help ensure that those stories are remembered and told long after they're gone. I think as you get older, Mark, more than anything in the world, you want to be remembered that, you know, you have not been forgotten. And certainly today, they are being put up on a, on a pedestal and they deserve it. Brought back together for what may be a final time to validate their contribution to the game they love. And to be here this week, see my dad shed tears over guys he hadn't seen over the years. I don't know, it's just, you know, it, it's indescribable. Sadly, there is a rapidly dwindling number of survivors of the Negro Leagues, and since statistical records are sparse, it's important to capture the rich and the revealing oral history of the game before it's too late. And one of the people that you saw in that story is Pat Williams. He's an NBA executive, an author, cancer survivor, and occasional contributor to this show. Pat was diagnosed with multiple myeloma, an incurable age-related blood cancer whose incidence continues to rise worldwide. Yeah, they, they said that myeloma is rare, but I'll, I'll tell you, I hear from two or three people a week you know, who have just been diagnosed or they want to call and encourage and here's what I learned and what can I do to help you and including Mel Stottlemyre, the pitcher, and uh, Don Baylor, the outfielder, and uh, Tom Masheri, the old Philadelphia Warrior, Wilt's teammate, and Sam Walton, you know, died of myeloma, and, and uh, Geraldine Ferraro is another one. And so there's some prominent members of the myeloma club. We're all part of the little team, you know, and wow. we all have our, our little, little niche here. Immediately after he was diagnosed, Pat told just about anybody that would listen that his mission was remission, and we're happy to say mission accomplished. Pat continues to work for the Orlando Magic. He's written nearly a dozen new books since his diagnosis and is a passionate advocate and fundraiser for multiple myeloma research. You know, when it comes to growing bolder, there's no age requirement. You can be 72 or you can even be 27. The question is, do you want more out of life? You know how nobody ever likes to stand out in a crowd? It's always safer to blend in. Well, you're about to meet someone who never really had a choice. A birth defect left her with no place to hide. She either had to give up or get over it. So she took a leap of faith and decided that if you're going to stand out, you might as well stand tall. I'm Jessica Fernandez. I'm 27 years old. I have spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia, which is, if we break it down, spondylo is spine. Uh, epiphyseal is, it means the end of bones. Dysplasia, it's basically the abnormal growth of cells. As a result, Jessica stopped growing at just four foot two. Yes, she's had neck, spine, and hip problems nearly all her life, but she's also had goals, hopes, and dreams. I didn't see myself as being any different than anybody else. And my mom would always tell me, Jessica, remember that the only thing that matters is what's in here and what's in here, right? Your mind and your heart. And, and I would say, like, why is mom telling me this, you know? <laughs> You're not someone who can blend in. No matter what you do, you're going to stand out. How did you learn to embrace that and use that as a tool? Yeah, well, Bill, I don't know if you've heard this quote that says, why would I want to fit in when I was born to stand out? Was it, was it hard to find your purpose? A lot of things have been hard in my life. That hasn't been one of them. Thankfully, I'm very, that is a blessing. My purpose has always been in my heart. And, and that's one of the things I focus on when things get difficult is I'm, I'm made for a greater purpose and I need to follow that purpose. She wanted to be a doctor, to specialize in pediatrics. She had the grades for it, but would she be allowed to? Where over 20% of Americans have disabilities, only 2% of practicing physicians do. I had many rejections from medical school. Rejection letter after rejection after rejection letter, and UCF said, yes, we want you, you know? And that was, that's huge. They opened the door for this. But after being accepted by the UCF College of Medicine, the pressure was on Jessica, and that's just the way she likes it. I have a lot of inner strength. <laughs> I mean, and even, you know, um, it, it comes out in, 
my body might be a little bit different than everybody else's, but I'm definitely very hard to break. <laughs> Do you get the feeling that, that people are always kind of saying, all right, let's see how she handles this. Oh, let's see what she does in this instance. Oh, let's see how she carries herself. Uh, yes, absolutely. I think, I think in any type of, whether you have a disability or you're in, in a minor, minority group or you're in the group of underrepresented people, there's a special eye on you. So whether she was looking through a microscope or feeling she was under one, Jessica realized it would constantly be up to her to wipe out the doubt. Even during rounds at hospitals and things like that, I just go right in there. I don't wait for somebody to tell me, oh, you know, would you like to do this? Would you, would you want this? I don't, I just get right in there next to the patient. I ask them a question, do I do the physical exam? And then all of a sudden, you know, the attending physician or the resident that I'm working with are kind of like, okay, that just happened, right? That she just takes initiative, right? And I think that's really important to break that barrier of fragility. Yeah, of course. Ready? You know what? Are you putting it? Yeah. Do you worry that, um external appearances, especially from a physician, count for something? Like, will, will, will people say, are you kidding? First of all, you, I mean, you look younger than you are. <laughs> are people, what is this, Doogie Hauser, my, sure. my doctor? Sure. Especially, I think, in pediatrics now, right? Because I'm small and I'll be in a hospital setting. Maybe a lot of people think, well, maybe she's a patient. And, and I do go in, in the hospital with my um, power wheelchair as well, because there's long distances, long days. So that helps me out. So. But that has happened where they ask me, you know, are you a patient? But most times, I think it's just in your, in your attitude, right? How you portray yourself. It's almost like how you walk in a room, right? And they just automatically know. Like, there, there's a presence there. Jessica, do you see that one of the reasons that many of us are so fascinated by you and are rooting for you is that we all have the insecurities inside of maybe not measuring up, of self-doubt, uh, of whatever. And we can see that manifest in you and are saying, man, if she can get through hers, maybe I can get through mine. That is exactly my message. It's, that's why I'm sitting here right now speaking to you is, the fact that we all struggle. It doesn't have to be a disability, it doesn't have to be something physical. It can be anything and it, it, everybody, right? Everybody has their cross to carry and, and, and we have to be there for another. We're placed on this earth to help the next person next to us, right? You've authored an amazing story up to here. What's the rest of the story? Ooh, that's still to be written, Bill, I think. <laughs> Boy, that's all you need to see to just know that she's going to be a success. So here's what we can learn from Jessica. First, it's on you to take the initiative. How can you really know what's out there unless you step out of your routine and take a look? Second, rejection is part of the process. Don't be afraid of it. It pushes you to make adjustments, to sharpen your focus, and to find the right path. And finally, you've got to stand tall. How you walk in a room makes a big difference. You need energy and attitude. No mumbling, no blending in. If Jessica can stand tall at four foot two, then so can you. My energy is the same as it was um, when I was 30. In fact, if uh, anything, it's more. So I think of aging as having different aspects as this chronological age, which is 71, there's biological age, which is probably 35, and there's psychological age, I'm still deciding what I'll do when I grow up. I think we have to focus on health span as we also focus on lifespan. I don't see any reason why you can't have the wisdom of experience and the biology of youth at the same time. So I see a bright future actually for living longer, living healthier. 
Always great to hear from Deepak. You know, living longer and healthier is a very real possibility for all of us. A 65-year-old woman who is living in the U.S. today now has a 25% chance of celebrating her 100th birthday, and soon it may be 50%. So what's next for you? What are you going to do with those extra years? You can get more tips, tools, and resources from Deepak Chopra and other Growing Boulder contributing experts at growingboulder.com launch. We are standing on an iceberg. There's the ocean tramp. Here's me standing on an iceberg. Sea ice. You know, our own Wendy Chioji is a great example of someone who has chosen to defy expectations and live every single day to its fullest. Wendy battled and beat breast cancer, only to be diagnosed years later with a rare and incurable form of cancer that's called thymic carcinoma. From day one of her now decades-long battle, Wendy has used her platform as a broadcast journalist to openly share details of her struggle in an effort to destigmatize a cancer diagnosis and mostly to give hope to others. There is a reason that it happened to me. I work at a television station and I'm fairly articulate and not afraid to talk about terrible things that happened to me. We're not that far away, Mark, like you said a little while ago, um, from when it was cancer. Nobody really talked about cancer. Um, and for me, with the television station and however many thousands of people watch every day, I can shout it, it's cancer, and I'm a survivor, it's cancer. Um, so that was my obligation. I do believe it was my obligation, but it was one that I fulfilled happily. Wendy fulfills that obligation and then some, and not just by her words, but also by her example. She's a world traveler and a world-class fundraiser for cancer causes. And while her battle is serious, frightening, and constantly frustrating, you'll rarely see her without a smile, and she'll show up at just about any event that's designed to raise awareness and money for cancer. One in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime. Pretty serious numbers. We're here today to tell you about a breast cancer fundraiser that's raising a lot of money and causing a lot of smiles. It's called Braha. Right, one, two, three. One, two, three. Thank you. You're welcome. Take a look at the bibbity bobbity boo bra. <laughs> we made this bra. Wow. It's the creation of Malin and Marla Tici. And we love princesses, and so it's a Cinderella bra. I think it just means a lot because it's important for us to raise awareness, and I hope that my daughter doesn't ever have to battle that disease. Lingerie company Casabella donated 50 bras for Bra Ha Ha, an unorthodox and really fun evening at Neiman Marcus. And this is a way for the women to really express themselves and laugh about it and feel good. You know, when you're doing something fun, it's it just take some of the edge off of things. The artists went wild with feathers, guitar picks, dragon boat themes, even booby, I mean bobby pins. Molly Rose and her friends whipped up this entry called Saving Second Base. We uh, have uh, baseball gloves and uh, cracker jacks and we burned our fingers gluing on all of these uh, peanuts. This is how I look with boots, right? Brahaha is especially powerful for Susie Carlton. She and two of her best pals were diagnosed with the disease. Anything I can do to help support people that are going through it, I was very blessed to catch mine early, so I just felt it'd be a great event. And I, I love doing things that are fun and creative, so let me do a little of everything and enjoy it. For Growing Boulder, I'm Wendy Chioji. Lean on it and then tuck everything and arch. And arch your shoulders back. Perfect. Chin down. And here's the thing about Wendy, she doesn't just raise money and awareness, sometimes she raises a few eyebrows. Awesome. Okay, give me as much hips as you can. There you go. Like the time she was asked to pose for a swimsuit calendar with 17 other survivors and cancer community advocates all over the age of 40. Of course, she said yes. This certainly got everyone's attention and some of their money. Wendy says it was a good time for a great cause, the ultimate win-win, and a great way for her to continue moving forward while giving back. And here's the really good news. Odds are we'll all have more time to move forward and more opportunity to give back. So the question is, what are you going to do? Almost anything is now possible. Our lives are becoming increasingly nonlinear with respect to major life events. 
There's no longer any arbitrary age at which we automatically transition from one life stage to another. There's no predetermined series of milestones that are attached to a calendar. We can go to school, change careers, start a new business, or pursue a new relationship at just about any age. We can start or work for a nonprofit, run for office, or campaign for candidates who support our positions. We can join the Peace Corps, start a blog, or build a website. Did you know that the fastest growing group of first-time entrepreneurs is now women over the age of 50? Yes, almost anything is possible, which is why we need coaches, guidance counselors, role models, business incubators, and educational opportunities, all geared toward men and women in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. Most importantly, we need a new belief system because when imagining what's next, we're all limited by the accepted boundaries of possibility, and those boundaries have been inaccurately drawn by an ageist culture. For most of us, now is not the time to wind down. It's the time to gear up for what's next. Now is the time to start growing bolder. We'll see you next time. Support for Growing Boulder provided by More information about all of the stories you've seen here today is available at growingbolder.com slash TV. And you can get inspired to keep rebranding aging when you connect with the Growing Boulder community on Facebook. Growing Boulder Apparel is available for $25 plus shipping and handling. A companion book, Growing Boulder, Defy the Cult of Youth, Live with Passion and Purpose by Mark Middleton is available as well for $25 plus shipping and handling. And you can subscribe to Growing Boulder Magazine, four quarterly issues for $29.97 a year. Order online at growingbolder.com slash TV.